Bangalore is a city that loves literature and as all of you so warmly and lovingly demonstrate, uh, it's also a city that of sporting people. So, uh, of course, the cricketers are best known. So let me start with the greatest yet least known Bangalore cricketer, Shanta Rangaswamy. The first great female cricketer from India who was from Karnataka in our state. We have, of course, had Prasanna and Chandrasekhar and, uh, and Vishwanath and, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, but then badminton, Prakash Padukone, uh, billiards, Pankaj Advani, athletics, uh, uh, Ashwin Nachepa, swimming, Nisha Miret, and even football. Uh, one of the first great Indian footballers was from Mangalore, the great Kempala. So we are a city of literature and sport, which is why it gives me ex extraordinary pleasure and joy to welcome two of the greatest sports writers in the world, Gideon Haig and Simon Cooper. Uh, and I'd like to begin, before I pose my question to them, uh, with a little bit about why I admire them. You know, I make a distinction between writers on sport and sports writers. So writers on cricket and cricket writers. Gideon is the greatest living writer on cricket, which may not make him the greatest living cricket writer. I think that's probably Michael Atherton in my view. So likewise with football. Simon <coughs> is the world's greatest living writer on football. And I don't football, I regret to say, I don't follow football as closely as I follow cricket, so I confidently put forward Michael Atherton's name as the greatest cricket writer, but there would be people who possibly connoisseurs of the sport, interested more in technique, uh, uh, would prefer to Simon when writing on cricket, names on football, I beg your pardon. Some names have been offered to me, Rory Smith of the New York Times, Jonathan Wilson, etc. But here you have, and I think that's really what is special about them. They are writers first and sports writers next. So to their writing or sport, they bring a very wide ambit of knowledge, of understanding, of experience. And interestingly, both of them have written major works outside their own sport. Obviously, they have written landmark books on football in Simon's case and cricket in uh, uh, Gideon's case. But Gideon is uh, the author of a great history of the office as an institution. He's also written several true crime mysteries. Uh, none of those Simon has written. How many, how many football books have you written, Simon? About six? Something like that. Something like that. Something like that. Okay. Uh, uh, but his probably, excuse me. Please, please, please. Uh, but pro possibly his best known book is a book called Chums, which is about some of the not very pleasant yet spectacularly successful people who were with him in Oxford, including Boris Johnson. Uh, so that's, I think, what makes their work special. Uh, I, as I said, I admire their work for a very long time. I subscribe to the FT Weekend, partly because of Simon's column, the Financial Times column. And a story about Gideon, Gideon I like to tell is that uh, I was reading, I bought his book On Wan, which is a short book on Shane Wan with a very clever title, modeled on Cloud Smith's On War. And I was taking a flight from <coughs> Delhi to Shanghai. And I was reading it. It was a late night flight. I read two chapters. And I was feeling tired. I said, I'll read the, I'll have a short nap. I put it on the seat next to me. And when I got up, the book had been filched. And I, I think probably by a Chinese man who admired Gideon Haig. Uh, so uh, I'm going to ask them a series of questions about their work. But let me start with you, Simon. You know, one of the things that I know about you uh, and uh, readers who read your columns attentively might have a vague clue is that you're a person of multiple nationalities. Uh, you live in France, which you write about. <coughs> uh, you studied in England. 
uh, you spent some formative years in Holland, but also, you know, in a sense, you're of South African origin. South African origin, right? So it's it's, it's quite extraordinary. That obviously adds adds to you the the, the, in, the interestingness of your work. But uh, can one be a world citizen? And if I have my own theory. I think one cannot be a world citizen because uh, there's no world state and you have to hold, uh, to be a citizen is to hold your own state to account. But A, can you be a world citizen? And B, which of these four nationalities do you most identify with? I mean, I think you can only be a world citizen because all of our problems that we worry about, whether it's climate change or poverty, are about an interconnected world. So it doesn't make any sense to worry about climate change as a citizen of Britain or a citizen of India. You can only think of these things in a global context. But of course, people like me are never popular um, because the force of nationalism, which always surprises me, is so strong. I mean, to me, it always seems like such a silly idea to think that the country you happen to have grown up in is the best, most blessed country in the world. It seems like a ludicrous idea, but many people believe it. And when I write about sports, of course, sports is all about nationalism. People care about their team largely because it's a reflection of the nation. Those 11 men in India shirts are India on that day. And so in sport, you're always writing about nationalism. And I write about it in a kind of cold-eyed way. I mean, I support Holland in football. I support South Africa in cricket, but not all that strongly. And so... When I write critically about England or about Holland or any country, people say, oh, you hate our country, which strikes me as ludicrous. Of course I don't hate your country. But you're more fortunate than someone like me. Because if I, they'll say you hate your own country. At least you have four countries, so you, you, you spread it out. Well, I, I get a version of that with England or writing about Britain, especially since Brexit, when there's been a rise in nationalism in Britain that when I write about Britain, they say, oh, well, how dare you write about this country? You don't even live here. You left the country to live in Paris, which also strikes me as ludicrous, as if only people who live in that country have a right to comment on its affairs. But, uh, I, mean, I don't really want to press you as to which, which of these four you choose. But shall we say, now do you feel as much French as you feel British? I, I have become French. Last year, I got the passport, which was blessed. But I feel belonging in a lot of different places. So when I walk into my old hometown in Holland or when I come back to the neighborhood in Paris or in parts of London, I feel totally at home. Parts of Johannesburg, I feel this is where my family came from. And I think you can belong a little bit in a lot of places. It's not, as, it's not the same as belonging completely in one place. That's not my line. I stole it from a novel called When Hitler Stole Pink Rabbit by the great Judith Kerr. So I feel I belong a little bit in a lot of places. Uh, any place you belong more to than others? Not really, no. But I mean, I feel, you know, I come here and I, I am open to the place. I don't understand it at all. I'm deeply interested in it. And I try to understand in the very short time I'm here how Bangalore works. And I could see... You know, I could live here. I, I could somehow make that work and try and understand this place without, I think, ever learning Canada, which I think would be beyond me at my age. <laughs> so, Gideon, I have a kind of a, a variant of that same question for you. When you're regarded uh, by many in India and probably elsewhere <clears throat> as a quintessential Australian, you know, uh, uh, because you're direct, you're blunt, you're fearless. Uh, uh, you know, there may be antonyms of direct, blunt, and fearless, which are uh, rude, cruel, stupid, and so on. Uh, but you regard it often as, and the Queen said Australian, because you're, you wear your heart in your sleeve, you're direct, you're clear. But actually, you were born in Britain. And one of the things that I think, at least, I mean, there are many people here who've read your books, on cricket particularly, and followed your columns. <coughs> and <coughs> I was told, and I, I thought it may even be true, <laughs> that you support England in the Ashes matches. <laughs> you, I mean, you, you, I tend to think of myself as a as a world citizen. Insofar as I feel, <laughs> insofar as I feel equally uncomfortable everywhere I go, and I mean, it's interesting to be regarded as a quintessential Australian. But I would not be regarded as a quintessential Australian in Australia. 
I've always been a bit of a, a, a loose fit over there. I've always been a little bit different, always been a little bit, um, uh, not distrusted, but, uh, but regarded as, uh, as unusual in, uh, in, the, uh, in the Australian habitat. Uh, do I support England in the cricket? Well, th there's a reason for that, in a way. It's, it's actually about more than um, your birthplace. It's about the fact that English... Th it's about that, that Ashes cricket is at its best when England is competitive. You always know that Australia is going to be competitive. You always know that Australia will be good. Um, that, uh, they, they very seldom go through a, a test series without winning a test. I think 2013 was the first time since 1977 they hadn't won at least one test in, a, in an Ashes series. Uh, if you're hoping for the best in cricket, you want England to measure up to Australia's standards. And therefore, you try to encourage them in whatever, whatever way is at your disposal by wishing them well. Uh, but interestingly, during the most recent Asher series, though, for the first time, I did feel perhaps more Australian than I'd felt before. I did what, think what, that there what? was something about England this year that was uh, made me feel more uncomfortable there than, 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 than hitherto. I did feel there was a certain sort of chippiness, a certain hostility towards outsiders, whether it's because of Brexit, whether it's because of two years of COVID, and, I, of course, that reached the flashpoint in, in what happened at Lords with, uh, with the stumping of Johnny Bairstow, where there was this grotesquely disproportionate response, uh, which could only have happened because, A, it was at Lords, and, B, because it involved Australia versus England. Had it been an Indian wicketkeeper running out an Australian batsman or, a, or an Australian wicketkeeper running out an Indian batsman, there would not have been the same hue and cry. But as it was we immediately had recourse to these very familiar, very stale stereotypes about what the English are and what the Australians are. Australians always regarding the English as a little bit too precious. The English regarding the Australians as always taking things that little bit too far. Uh, and it was, it was disappointing, but enlightening at the, uh, at the same time. I, re I reached the end of the, uh, of the series, having always been rather agnostic on the subject, feeling quite solidly Republican for the first time in my life. <laughs> You know, after that incident, uh, uh, as you say, uh, Kelly's stumping of Besto, which is perfectly within the rules. Uh, I mean, it was like, I think not since Bodyline have, has it evoked that those kind of way. Both, both, the, both the prime ministers got involved. And what was interesting was, uh, it was, uh, you know, uh, working class Australian yeah. versus elite English. Yeah. 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 Because Rishi Sunak is not only the richest British Prime Minister since Lord Rosemary in 1890-something, <laughs> he went to Winchester at yeah. Elite Public School. And uh, Albanese went to what, Geelong Grammar or something? It was, yeah, yeah. It's, and that's what, that came up, that came up. He it said, did, yeah. It came yeah. Up. Right. And of course, uh, what, what happened at Lords was automatically connected to every other previous acknowledged Australian indiscretion or transgression on the, uh, on the, on the field of play. Uh, it, it, it's a pretty fertile seedbed for, uh, for distrust, but, but, which is ironic because this Australian team is probably the best behaved Australian team of my experience. It's the most <laughs> affable, it's the most accessible, uh, it's the friendliest, it's the softest Australian team. Uh, and yet at the same time, it, it, it's, it's the heir to the previous, uh, the misdeeds of the previous generation. And I think uh, on that, on the best behaved, uh, I think Cummins deserves some credit for that. And prob yeah, probably paid too. before that, but, yeah. but I think Cummins yeah. more than anyone. Yes, yeah. You know I, mean? I think, it, look, it's an experienced Australian team. It's a worldly Australian team. They've played uh, in every country. They've, you know, they've gone to places that the previous generation didn't go to. They were very keen to go to Pakistan, for instance, because it was something they hadn't done before. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a team that does have... Uh, a hinterland. It does have a sense of the wider interests of the game. But of course, you know, when push comes to shove, they, um, they will fight their corner. They, um, they fight tigerishly <coughs> like the best Australian teams of yore. I have to ask you a follow-up question because of the audience. And uh, your thoughts on uh, what is now being spoken of has been over some time that despite the antiquity of the ashes, despite all the myth and, yes. uh, you know, sort of that's encrusted around it and the literature and the legend. The real rivalry today is Australia v. India. Would yeah. you agree? Yeah. And so your thoughts yeah. on that and why that's happened? 
Look, I, yeah. look I, yeah, I, I accept that. I, I, I certainly accept that's, that's an argument. I think that we did see something of the vitality of the Ashes in this series, precisely because England played a kind of cricket that was quite expressive, quite charismatic, uh, quite explosive uh, at, at times, and the two teams were very closely matched, as often happens when Australia goes to, uh, to England. And the Australia-India series, I felt, was a bit of a disappointment, frankly, having looked forward to it for a long time, on the basis of India's achievements in Australia, which, you know, they won the last two series in, uh, in Australia on our own shores, and the, the, there aren't too many uh, feats in international cricket that, that come harder than that. But I did feel as though the services didn't do justice to either of the teams, actually. When I watch, when I watch Australia play India, I want to see the best of both sides. I want to see outstanding batsmanship on both sides. I don't want to see test matches end in two and a half days. Yeah. I don't think that's to, to anyone's advantage, yeah. and certainly not to crickets. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> Simon, uh, you know, uh, you write a weekly column for the FT. You... Um, write features for the FT uh, probably what eight or ten times a year. You write occasionally for other publications. Uh, you write books. How do you do it all? Do you ever get writer's block or deadline anger? Well, I've been talking to Gideon the last couple of days who went around Coven Park and he's written 50 books. I've written seven, so you know, it's nothing. Um, I don't get writer's block. I, when I write, the writing is just the final stage because you research, but then I spend more time structuring than I spend writing. So writing the actual column, sitting down and writing the 750 words, takes me about 40 minutes. I mean, after that, I have to do fact-checking and edit a bit. But I feel it's, it's a bit... I was saying this to Gideon at breakfast, so excuse me for repeating myself, but... I feel I'm like a carpenter who knows how to make tables. So I make tables, and some tables are better than others, but yes. they'll never be bad. And I don't have block about making, making tables, no. You know, so I used to write a weekly column. Then, because I'm much older than you, I converted it to a fortnightly column, right, which I still continue. Uh, we'll come to books in a little while. Uh, so you think of my column is published on Saturday. Uh, so, uh, your column probably goes online now on Thursday. Is that right? Yes. So, uh, you have to give it in by Wednesday? By Monday, actually. Oh, oh all right. Is that... Why, why I, I, I mispredicted the Dutch election because I predicted it too early and then there were late polls showing I was wrong. And, oh, yeah. But you have, a, you have an editor giving you feedback and, and all of that. And so, I, I just, I, and, and it's always good. You know, for example, I have always in my bank two or three columns that are... Technically non-topical, you know, it could be about a musician or a book and so on. Now, uh, uh, it so happened that last night I was at dinner with a young man who writes a column, even younger than you, uh, in his early 40s, who writes a column or not on sport or something else. And uh, he absolutely scandalized me by saying, he's a clever young man, very able young man, and I'm sure he has been or will be at this festival. Uh, he said, I use chat GPT to give me my first drafts. But I use AI. He didn't say chat GPT, so maybe. And, and then we got into an argument. Uh, and I'm not saying he convinced me, but he had a, some good points. He said, then I rewrite it and I add stuff. But I say, hey, I have to write on, you know, a column on uh, why is the BJP sweeping the elections by tomorrow? What are the reasons? And uh, this anonymous thing gives me something, which are the rework. Now, obviously, I was horrified, but is that just age? You're kind of age-wise and technology-wise, because I'm a Luddite, you're in between me and this young man. So I'd like your thoughts on that. Well, I, like every columnist in the world, I asked ChatGPT to write me a column, and it was so bad that it wouldn't have run in a high school magazine. But... <laughs> When I said this to a friend who is much more involved in AI, he says, what you should do with ChatGPT is you should train it up on your subjects, which apparently you can do, and then use it to generate ideas. So I'm now wrestling towards a column about Bangalore and developing world megapoles. How do you become New York City and not become Lagos? So that is, I think, an interesting question to which I don't have an answer. 
And my friend would say, put those questions to chat GPT and don't let it write your column, but let it suggest ideas and insights. You know, I, I for example, I would not, uh, that kind of column, I, I would never use chat GPT. Your ideas must be yours. What you could say, I, st I mean, I'm, I'm grateful because when I started writing my columns, which are 30 years ago, there was no internet, there was no fact checking. So I would say, what is the population? Now I can say, what is the population of Lagos versus Delhi? What percentage in shanty towns? Uh, is there any, uh, how many billionaires? Right, so you, in that, yes, later on, but uh, arguments I'm not so sure. I mean, it, well, I mean, we, I mean, being a columnist, as you know, is you're constantly looking for ideas. And a column, I think, is one idea. Because in 750 words, all you have the space to do is expound one idea and back it up with anecdotes. And so I come to places, to festivals like this, to hunt for ideas by talking to intelligent people. And if ChatGPT can give me some of those ideas, then that would solve a lot of problems. But they're not, they may be intelligent, but they're not people. No, but maybe they've sourced ideas from you or from somebody else. <laughs> Okay, one follow-up... Uh, Ram GPT, that's, <laughs> that's what I want. <laughs> one follow-up question on being a columnist. Uh, so like you, but unlike most columnists, certainly unlike most Indian columnists, uh, I, my email is at the bottom of my column. Not the email that the two of you write to me to, but some another email. And I usually always reply. And two things have happened in the 30 years I've been writing columns. One is... Is, is, is a variable. I get much less hate mail. Although uh, the, my views are actually much more unfashionable now than they were after. And that's because all the hate has shifted to Twitter. So I, I don't have to say that. But the, what is constant is I get interesting ideas from readers. Sometimes corrections, not just factual, but my argument, you know, you didn't really look at this. Uh, Sometimes ideas in future columns. So I'm deeply, and of, 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 and of course there'll be a lot of, uh, since my, and you'll also have this, and Gideon, I mean Gideon is much more reclusive. His email is not on, on his column, and he's not even on Twitter. So, you know, he's, he's kind of, so the kind of things you, you get, you know, sir, uh, I've written a book, can you read it? Can you blurb it? Can you introduce it? Right. But in the middle of all that, there are lots of really interesting, from unknown people. And, some, and even sometimes book manuscripts that I've had got published. So how useful has been this, giving this, your email? And is, is it, one, one last question, is it a standard FT practice or only a few of you have it? I think it's standard and FT emails are, you know, standard, standardized so you know who it is. You get a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, there's this one absolutely world famous musician who every few months will write to me and say, you wrote this, but I think this, and he comes out with a very interesting argument. And I think, wow, that he's spending his time, and other people, they'll write, you wrote a column, but this is my view, and then they write a kind of column for free, which, as a columnist, I can't understand. They go through that whole intellectual effort to send me an email of about the length of my column, make, writing a column, and nobody's paying them. I don't understand. The abuse I get, not from Twitter, which I... In are, my you, are you sure from, that reply was not written by ChatGPT? They said... Give me an answer to Simon Cooper's column of last week. But why are they doing it? What's the incentive? They're only sending it to me, so they're not getting any kind of worldly status or money from it. I think they really want to give their views. And I want to give my views. It's partly why I write columns. But the abuse I get actually are in the comments, which in the FT skew very far right. My rule with replying is, if it's abusive, I won't bother. So you can write an email saying your column was idiotic, your column was silly, uh, you're lying which I find very irritating. Why, why do you think I'm lying? Um, but <laughs> it's fine, you can write that if, if it makes you feel happier, if it solves the frustrations in your life, but I'm not gonna waste my time replying to that. If people are courteous, I will try to reply. So Gideon, I asked him about deadline fatigue. Yeah. Do you, and my question to you is about, do you have cricket writing fatigue? Gideon has written, I think his 41st book is due. At, at least half uh, on cricket, or 25? That's right. That's right. Uh, now, do I have cricket fatigue? Let me, let me finish. No. I have yes. to finish my question. I'm very careful uh, not to get cricket uh, writing okay. fatigue. Okay, I, right. I know that. Do you have cricket writing fatigue? And do you especially have writing books about Ashes series fatigue? <laughs> because you just gave me your latest, which must be your fifth or sixth on Ashes series. Yes, yes. 
Actually, is this your last well, book? Yeah, it? unusually, it was actually worth it. This was a series that justified a book. And in fact, I hadn't intended to write a book at the start of the series, but the, the series kind of forced me into it. It, it, it felt as though that this book needed, that this, this series needed some sort of permanent um, memory. Uh, do I get Ashes fatigue? Well, I've certainly seen a lot of bad Ashes cricket in no, my I, time. No, okay, okay. Will you yeah. write another Ashes series book? I don't think so. This was my seventh Ashes tour of England. Uh, I did feel as though there was a sense of, uh, of last things about this trip. And if it is the last one, then it's been a good note to go out on. Will you write a, ever write a Border Gavaskar series book? If it justified it. Okay. I would have been prepared to do it for this last series if it had been remotely good. But it, okay. was, it was very disappointing. Uh, I did actually do a book called uh, um, The Standard Bearers, which is a compilation of my writing on the 2018-19 season in Australia, which, in which, of course, India prevailed at Australia's expense. And it was, I mean, that was a wonderful series to write about with wonderful characters and, and wonderful achievements. You know, Pajara is just a joy to write about uh, because, I mean, he gives you so much opportunity to do so. You can sit there watching all Pajara all day. And on a dull day, all you do is you look at Kohli because he'll give you something There'll be some thought that occurs to you about Virat Kohli. He's just, he's throwing off ideas constantly. If there's a, if there's a dull passage in play, Kohli is a, is a, is a guaranteed um, entertainment in his own right. You know, you, uh, I'll put you on the spot a little bit. You know, I, I, one is all, often asked, you know, if you write many books. So which is your favorite book? Right. Uh, and I'm not going to ask you that. I mean, I have a kind of a standard answer. If you have more than one child, you don't have a favorite child. You don't have one. All right, etc. Now, you have one child, and you, and you, have, you have 41 books, so you have a different problem from mine. All right. Now, and I, what I'm going to say is, and I, I have read m many, but not all of your cricket books. I have my own special favorites, which I may reveal, but about. All your cricket books, to begin with, because this audience might be putting Sorry, yeah. which, are, which are the ones you're most proud of? I won't ask you which are the ones you're most embarrassed about, but which are the ones you feel satisfied? Okay, okay I did what a craftsman should do. Yeah. Uh, and why? It would only be satisfied. I don't ever feel particularly proud yeah, of, yeah. of my books. Uh, I don't think that's, that's my place to do so. Probably, I mean, On Warn, which you were kind enough to speak about in such terms before, is probably the... Um, the book that's come closest to its original realization. You know, I had a very strong idea of the way in which I was going to do this book. And the end of the process, I thought, yeah, that's what it always was destined to be like. And I wrote it very quickly. I wrote it in, in a month. Uh, and I wrote it in a kind of a, a fugue state. It was every sort of thought that I'd ever had about, about Shane Warne. And I had the opportunity to, uh, to road test them, to see what they looked like in, uh, in print. So that was kind of satisfying. And, uh, and I go back and I look at it from time to time and I think, yeah, I, I'm glad I did it. Because I mean, the, the objective of doing the book was to write about Warren as a player while he was still fresh in my memory. Because I feared that uh, as the years passed, we'd forget exactly what the experience was like to watch Shane Warren. And it was the most extraordinary uh, sporting theatre. I was a sense I wanted to capture this for a future generation. So I do feel some pleasure in that. I think Mystery Spinner, the book that I wrote about Jack Iverson, gives me uh, pleasure because, once again, that was me indulging a long-term curiosity. I went to the same school as Jack Iverson. I'd always been puzzled by the fact that he played test cricket, but he'd hardly played cricket at school. You know, wh what an improbable cricketer he was. How did, this, how did this story ever take place? So once again, it was a question of me indulging my, uh, my own curiosity. But the, I mean, my, my response to, um, to, uh, to the question, what's my favorite book, is, is generally speaking always the next book I'm going to write. <laughs> because when I'm in the process of writing it, I'm more excited about that yeah. than I've ever been excited by any book that I've written before. Uh, and there's a sense that when you finish the book, it's almost, it's not dead to you, but... but You've moved on very strongly by the time you, by the time, well, it might in the case of my career, uh, usually by the time I've finished, a book is published, I'm halfway through writing the next book. So, uh, so in a sense, it's, um, 
it's uh, it's it's up there on the shelf and it's and it's out of sight out of mind so uh, uh i'll tell you my favorite cricket books of gideons in a minute but just i thought i'll share a memory of how i first got to know gideon and corresponded with him which was many years before we met i was compiling an anthology of cricket writing and i read his work and i wanted his work so i wrote to him to send me articles from which i was to choose and the one i chose this is like 2000 is 22 years ago is prophetic uh, in terms of uh, what the world of sport and marketing and celebrity would in film and music and instagrams and cultures become he sent me an article he wrote called <coughs> on, it was on supposedly on the greatest you know it was on someone who's universally recognized as the greatest australian cricketer ever and with the exception of gary sobers the greatest cricketer ever but the article was called <coughs> sir donald brand name so how in the 1930s uh, you know bradman was exploiting his name i mean it's a, so that's the kind of you know uh, that's why i say with simon and, and gideon you know you will not find writers in sport like them because it's not just writing about the sport is bringing society and politics and culture so gideon let me say that um, uh, i have three of the three favorite cricket books of yours are the two you mentioned on one which i've spoken about and the one of jack i was in mr spinner <coughs> because if there's anyone here who studied in national college anybody here studied in national school or national college any no hands up here a few okay or uh, even if you haven't write a book on the greatest mystery spinner of all time bs chandrashekar from bangalore right because with this kind of, when i read that book i thought i thought about chandrashekar and the third book of yours which i think i think will be history may judge it to be the best of all your cricket books is <coughs> called stroke of genius it's about will we the, the most famous cricketing photograph is victor trumper going out to drive you will see it it had you seen pavilions all over the world and this is a book about how that photograph was taken who was the photographer the art of black and white photography how sports photography emerged in the late 19th century how that photograph became iconic i mean again it's a book that uh, you know a cricket writer qua cricket writer yes. uh, you know uh, could not have written okay now uh, i'd like to leave some time for questions but i have a, a couple of uh, uh, i have a couple of uh, questions you i have a couple of questions to two of you what is um, given how i've introduced you which i think is a fair enough introduction that your writers who happen to write on sport <coughs> uh simon <coughs> how have your literary political influences outside sport influenced your writings on sport um my father is an anthropologist still active still writing books and i've always learned to see life anthropologically which is you kind of study people inside their culture and their place so that's how i've always looked at sport from the start and i was helped by um playing sports in different countries so i grew up mostly in the netherlands and i was i played cricket in holland and i was proud that they were at the world cup and they did well here and um so you so are a closet nationalist <laughs> i feel attached to holland especially in sports yeah and i grew up in that sporting culture where un completely unlike here you, i would cycle to the cricket club i would cycle to the football club and then i moved back to england when i was 16 and i saw that english people had a completely different attitude especially to football. Uh you know cricket in Holland we were just trying to imitate the English but in football the English have this incredible stupidity in their view of football and it was clearly modeled on a kind of military model it was about valor, power and uh aggression whereas in Holland football is a game you play with your head. And so I began to see you know there are different ways that different countries think of their sport. So I I wrote my first book Football Against the Enemy as a kind of I I never called it that but a kind of anthropology of football in different countries. And so I think that anthropological view of sport has always shaped how I write about sport. And I think writing about sport you always have to find something different because if you're at the game everyone else is at the game. What are you going to add? You know, he was bold to run before his century. What a tragedy. Everyone is going to say that. 
he disappointed the crowd. Everyone knows that. So I've always thought, I've looked at all these writers in serried ranks in the press box or in the press conference, and I thought, what can you do that is different? Because in, in writing, you never want to, there's just no point in saying what everyone else is going to say. But writers, I know in recent columns, uh, <coughs> Orwell has been figuring. Sorry? So, uh, in recent columns of yours, writers outside sport have influenced you. I know Orwell is someone who occasionally figures in your columns. So have there been others like yeah. that, who's just whose literary style or analytical, you know, uh, Orwell is kind of the patron saint of journalism, and I think almost every journalist has that relationship with Orwell. I mean, he said in words that I recognize that he had an unhappy love affair with crickets until about the age of 30, and he asks, you know, why do we not consider a six by W.G. Grace art, and he thinks about that. But Orwell is not my patron saint in sport, but in how to be a journalist, and one thing I get from Orwell is, and I saw this when you were speaking here yesterday about personality cults, if you have worked out what you think, and what you think is going to be unwelcome and unpopular, you have to say it anyway. So step one in journalism yeah. is what do I really think, which is difficult to disentangle from all the ambient noise and the cliches and accepted opinion around you. And once you've decided what you think, just say it. And if people don't like it, well, tough. Yeah. Uh, though, of course, I mean, I've grown up with Orwell too. Uh, and you know, I have... Actually, two volumes of his collected essays, one in one of my homes, other. But there have been some interesting recent revelations uh, about his patriarchy and his so on. Anyway, that, 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 that's a separate question. Uh, Gideon, so, the, so to you two, um, you know, outside of cricket, what are the kind of literary, political, cultural influences that have molded how you write about cricket? Well, I can remember reading Beyond the Boundary when I was, when I was young and being... How old were you? Uh, it's probably about 15 50. or so, yeah. and it, it, it came to me with, a, with an exalted reputation, and uh, it, it partly um, lived up to that. I think there are, there are, there are flat spots, there are, there are, there are, there are weaknesses in, uh, in Beyond the Boundary, but some of the sentiments have remained with me ever since. Yeah. Uh, one of them is, whoever will write a biography of Brabham must, must write a history of Australia. I thought yes. that is very true because yes. you know, he is a kind of an Australian archetype yeah. and you, ne you need to understand your country. But you need to understand Bremen in terms of, of his country. The other thing that he said, which is something I call to mind often, which is that um, sports writing needs to have some sort of technical foundation and anything else is mere impressionism. I thought you do actually have to take an interest in the technique of sport. You can't merely yeah. sort of indulge yourself aesthetically. You need sort of an, an understanding of the, of the biomechanics of, of cricket and the history of, uh, of techniques. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the ways in which I've continued to, to keep that in mind or to reinforce that is to continue playing. I still play for, for a club where I've played for 30 years. I'm a doer opening batsman who relies on the pace of the ball uh, in order to score runs, uh, who likes putting himself to the technical and temperamental test of playing even at, at, a, at a humble standard, who loves the camaraderie of, uh, of, of the club, who loves uh, the, uh, the, uh, the esprit de corps of a, of a dressing room, who rejoices in winning. I, I love winning. Um, you know, I don't mind losing, but I do. Winning is better. Uh, that has helped me understand the way in which, uh, given me an ongoing appreciation of how cricketers of all kinds and from all countries approach the game. Because under the skin, cricketers, there, there is a commonality to, to cricketers, whatever country they're from. Beyond the boundary, what I took from it, and I agree there, there are lesser passages, is that sports is a serious subject. That sport yeah. can reveal yeah. worlds to you. And so I remember the description of the five cricket clubs in Trinidad, yes. stratified yeah. by color, from yeah. the all white to the completely black. Yeah. Yeah. But the, I mean, you asked about literary influences. When I was 11, we were living in California for a year for my father's work, and I got very into baseball. And I read this story by a writer I'd never heard of called John Updike about Ted Williams, the great Boston Red Sox batter. And I thought, so it's about 40 pages about Williams, what kind of guy he is, and I thought, wow, this is, this is better than the stuff I've been reading about football and cricket in Europe. I didn't realize you could write about sports people as if they were three-dimensional humans, and that kind of stayed with me. 
baseball writing in general was so much better than anything yes, I'd read yes. in Europe. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good point. Um, a, a, a writer that I've gone back to again and again is David Halberstam. And David Halberstam, as well as writing you know, The Best and the Brightest and The Powers That Be, and uh, also wrote very well about baseball. He wrote a book called The Summer of 49, which is about the, great, the first great post-war World Series. And I read that in the, in the early 1990s, and I thought, I could do this for cricket. I, I, could, I, I could write about the period between the cricketers of Bradman's era and the cricketers of Chapel's era, uh, look at Australia through the the uh, the aperture of of cricket in order to evoke what society was like in Australia in the 50s and 60s, and it, my publisher at the time said, um, the period uh, of the world that is strangest is the period immediately before you were born because it looks so much it looks so similar but it, and yet is so different, and that's certainly what I found when I wrote uh, when I wrote the Summer Game, and that is a direct uh, result of having read David Halberstam's The Summer of 49. Um, yes, I'd also say that cricket writing has historically, had historically been much better than football writing, and football writing has been catching up. So, uh, I mean, I actually slightly disagree with, about baseball, because not because of the quality of the writing, but the quality of the sport is even more vulgar than T20. Well, cricket I has, mean, it cricket has become baseball. Yeah, which is sad, because, you know, you only have 90 degrees, you, you can't move the ball in and out. So anyway, forget that. But uh, on sport, a book on, you know, I was talking to a Brazilian friend, Brazilian historian friend once about Beyond the Boundary. And he asked me to read Eduardo Galeano's book, which is magnificent, Soccer in Sun and Shadow. Uh, I, it's a bit too lyrical and uncritical for my liking. Okay. I'm sorry, I know that's sacrilege. <laughs> uh, uh, one last question to the two of you. Uh, Gideon, you said your best book is the one you're writing. So tell us about it. Best well, ever book. It's got nothing to do with cricket. That's fine. Yeah. That's, that's why you're here. Well, the book that I've written most recently is, uh, is a book which I've just given you. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a little book about, uh, about a, a young woman who disappeared from an ocean liner off the coast of Australia in 1949. And it was a story that I came upon by accident. Often the stories that I, that I write about are stories that just come, come into my ken by sheer chance. And I always think, well, the, this is fascinating, but the only way that I'm going to find out more about it is if I write a book about it. Uh, so it, in a sense, the, the, the book becomes a, a means by which I indulge my curiosity. But I was interested in the idea of disappearance, the impact of, the, of, a, of a person being there one minute and not the next. Uh, what leads up to a disappearance and what, what, what are the conditions precedent to a disappearance that places a person in a position of vulnerability where they can simply vanish from the face of the earth and what is the impact on succeeding generations of a family in dealing with, the, um, with an incomplete narrative. At least when a person dies in your family, you, 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 you understand the end point. Uh, in, the, in the case of this particular story, as I discovered it when I, when I traced down the family and I, and I trawled my way through the relevant historic records, this was a family that had never come to terms with the fact that this woman had disappeared. They'd always been wondering. They were like, they were like those families at the end of the First World War who never knew where their, where their loved one was buried. Uh, who, who in, in Australia, historically, there was, this, there was this fashion for leaving the back door open just in case... That, uh, that, that son came back from the World War and you weren't, you weren't home when they, when they got there. So it was a means by which to explore uh, the, the literary genre of, of disappearance, uh, the significance of, uh, of the 20th century in, in terms of disappearance, through the, through the, um, the, uh, the, the singularity of this, uh, of this little tiny story. It's only a short book. It's something that I did as a kind of a five-finger exercise. It's not a great work of literature. It's just a work of foot slogging journalism, but it was a means by which I, um, I satisfied my own curiosity. And in the end, that's, I think that's what Simon and I are both doing. We're, we're people who are curious about the world, who have, had, who have found in journalism a vehicle by which to, to indulge themselves. So Simon, I know you have several uh, books in the fire, but tell us just the one, one a little bit about one of them you're working on. Uh, one of them is All My World Cups. I'm also doing a book about British political corruption, but All My World Cups is I've been to every football World Cup since 1990 in Italy. 
and I'm trying to weave it together into a narrative that jumps from, you know, Qatar to Russia to Japan, chronologically, of course, because every book should be chronological, except there's a very good reason not to, and try and tell a story of the modern world through the story of the World Cup. Thank you.